Hi everyone, my name is Marty Thompson with the American Marketing Association and welcome to our 2020 Experience Design Virtual Conference. Uh, this presentation is sponsored by Lucid Press and our presenter is Christina Sanders, Inbound Marketing Manager at Lucid Press. Uh, just a few quick notes before we get started. You can utilize the studio chat for general comments and please use the Q&A tab to present uh, questions to our speaker. The presentation will be available on demand uh, once we conclude. So without further ado, let's get started with Christina. There's been some feedback, if we can take a look at that. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Christina Sanders. I am the Inbound Marketing Manager for Lucid Press. Uh, Awesome, good, they've got rid of the echo. So Lucid Press, in a nutshell, is a brand templating platform that allows marketing teams to templatize their marketing content. And a little bit about me. So I actually started at an agency focused on digital marketing and a lot on SEO specifically. And something I noticed was a lot of SEOs and embed marketers tend to fall into these two camps. There's the people who like to chase an algorithm, basically focusing on what do I need to manipulate to get to the top of a Google search result. And then there's the people who say, you know what, I'm just going to create really good content, publish it, and kind of hope for the best. Uh, but what I found is the really best marketers are able to take a step back and say, look, Google's goal ultimately is to provide the best content experience possible for their users. And I think that's something we as marketers can really learn from. Instead of asking ourselves, how can I manipulate this? Or just saying, well, I think this is a good piece, so let's go with that. Um, instead thinking about how do I provide the exact piece of content my customers are looking for so they walk away with exactly what they need. And so I'm going to be going in depth on that today, talking about the content experience. So today's customer really has their pick of the litter, meaning there are more than enough companies for them to do business with, and it's getting harder and harder for companies to stay relevant. So I just put up a quick poll. If you guys want to weigh in, if you were to guess what percentage of the world's largest companies will disappear by 2027? All right, so looks like majority saying about 25% will disappear. A few, 75%, little pandemic negativity there. Um, all right, so the answer actually is 50%. So right now they're projecting that half of the world's largest companies will disappear by 2027. And that really speaks to just how competitive the world has gotten. If you even just look at the average lifespan of your S&P 500 company, back in 1964, they are expected to stick around for 33 years. Fast forward to 2027, that's expected to only last for 12 years. So as businesses think about staying competitive in today's world, creating content to show up really isn't enough anymore. Pretty much every company has made this shift to creating content for nearly every channel that comes along in an effort to make their business stand out. But of course, like everything in marketing, and this is quickly becoming less and less effective due to customers just being inundated with this content from every direction. 
right now, 72% of organizations are producing significantly more content than they did a year ago. And you'll notice the stat is from 2014. And so just imagine just how much more, even more content companies are creating today. If you just look at ads alone, in 1984, a person saw an average of 2,000 ads per day. And then by 2014, they saw around 5,000. And that's just ads. So it's really literally impossible for customers to consume all of the content that is put in front of them on a daily basis. So my uh, theory to pose to you today is that the current approach to content marketing is broken. So let's take a look at how we got here in this timeline. So if you come back in time with me, we have the creation of the Internet. And that led to an ease of access that had really never been seen before. We all of a sudden, we could create content and post it relatively easily and relatively cheaply. And this led to a content democratization where if you think back in time to, you remember when you created your very first MySpace page or your first Blogspot blog, this was the very first time people could just go on and post content at will. And what quickly happened was we quickly became inundated with content. So in 1994, the very first blog was created by Justin Hall. Almost a decade later, 2002, Melinda Roberts created the first mommy blog. And then after that, the timeline really started speeding up. 2005, 32 million Americans were regular blog readers. And by 2010, there were over 152 million active, active blogs, with almost all major businesses having their own blog. So it's been nearly a decade now that businesses have really adopted content marketing and posting on the internet as a way of marketing their business. And so because of this, it's led to a company having to stand out in a different way. Over this past decade, as companies have had to try to stand out through all of the noise, they started personalizing content. So if you think about the very first people who did this, the people who Amazon, who started making product recommendations for the very first time. And a lot of companies, they've adopted buyer personas and content maps to the point now where pretty much everyone is attempting to personalize and target specific individuals on this scale. But of course, because so many people have adopted this, we're in 2020 now and it, pretty much everyone has tried to personalize their content, customers now expect that. It doesn't necessarily stand out in a way that it did back when Amazon first started making customized product recommendations. Which is why I believe we really need to start thinking about content in the terms of a content experience. So, and to do that, I believe for businesses to cut through the noise today, businesses really have to stop seeing content as a marketing activity and instead approach it as really a critical part of their actual customer experience. So it's really not a new idea that the customer is really the one who decides what your brand image is. Most marketers and businesses know that. However, most businesses also need that reminder that no matter how many brand guides or key messages they put together, if there's a disconnect between what you're saying your brand is and what the customer actually experiences, um, there's, your brand story isn't necessarily getting across the way that you want it to to your customers. So um, it looks like there might be an issue with the audio again. So I like this quote from Jeff Bezos. It says, your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. And what I like to point out about this quote is, the customers are talking about you. You're just not in the room. And so if businesses aren't proactively going out and seeking feedback on whether the content is jiving with their customers and whether their customer experience is jiving, then they're really being left in the dark as to whether their content experience is effective or not. And 
frequently when we talk about customer experience, the majority of examples we hear are really related to physical interactions. So I'll give an example of this. It will probably shock a lot of you to hear a positive customer experience around airport security, but that's what I'm going to share today. Uh, so just a reminder, since we've all been isolating and not flying, your typical experience in the United States to go through security, you show up, you have these little small bins about the size of a laptop, so of course you have to grab two, three, or four so that you can actually fit all your stuff in. And you have a huge line of people waiting behind you, so there's this ongoing stress of, you need to get all my stuff, pile it into the bin, and constantly worrying that you're taking too long for the people behind you. Um, but I flew to London a few years ago, and my experience going through their security system was so delightful that it was actually one of the things I came home and was like, you guys, you could not believe what this experience was. And it's because they had this setup where you walk up, you have your own little setup station, and they have a bin that's actually large enough for all your stuff. So you have that one bin, you pile everything in, you put it onto the conveyor belt, you keep going. And it was so delightful and not stressful that I couldn't stop talking about it. So those are the typical examples we talk about with customers' experience. And those are great. Those are really important ways to improve the customer experience. But what I want to talk about today is it's not just limited to those physical interactions. It can also include every interaction a customer has with your content. To give you another example, I subscribe to a clothing service. They give you a customized showroom once a month where you can then go in to see and say, okay, I want to purchase something this month or I want to skip the month. And the way they set it up, you get a text with a link that sends you right to your personal portal. You get a reminder text to let you know, hey, you need to shop or skip the month. When you do purchase something, you get a text saying, thank you for your order. Here's a link so that you can track your shipment. If you click that link, again, it takes you right where you need to go. There's not multiple steps. Then when the order actually ships, a box comes to your house. And on the front of it, on the very top of the box, it says, hello, gorgeous. And then you open it up and it says, you have great taste. And the first time I got this, I was like, well, yes, I do. Thank you very much. And that kind of experience really helped bridge that gap between the, the, the brand experience on the left side, so that what they, the brand story they're wanting to give, and the customer experience on the right. Okay, looks like we're working on the audio. Can you hear me okay now? Okay. All right, so what I'm going to go through are the three principles for creating a good content experience. So we can transform the way we think about content from focusing on the marketer's experience over to the customer's experience. And instead of thinking about volume-driven marketing, so how do we produce a large amount of content for everyone, how do we switch to a more value-driven focus? So first principle is consistency. Now, a lot of times when we talk about customer experience, it's really easy to focus on the huge one-time actions companies take for a single customer. These are actions you think about. They're the ones that make the news. They start trending on social media. And those actions certainly have their place. But taking that extra 1% consistently, so those little small extra areas of delight, can have a significantly more impact than taking that huge leap occasionally because that's what allows you to really connect and build brand trust with your customers, with all of your customers as opposed to a select few. 
And brand consistency, so consistently presenting your brand, is a really important way to achieve that 1%. Uh, marketers already know the importance of branding, um, but achieving that consistency is hard. Uh, we've completed a study a few times the, uh, over the years, and what we found is consistently presented brands are three to four times more likely to have brand visibility. And if you think about in a time where it's really competitive and even the world's largest companies are struggling to stay relevant, what could be better than having an improved brand visibility? But of course, brand consistency is really hard to achieve because remember, everyone is a content creator. We're already 10 years past when every single company had a blog. And so because of that, because everyone is a content creator, everyone in your organization impacts the customer experience for good or for bad. So I don't think there's a single marketer or creative on here today who doesn't relate to this graphic. Um, as marketers, we produce brand guides and style guides and we present them. And it's not even necessarily that these are hard to achieve or that they aren't even well received. It's that then people then turn around after the meeting, they forget about it, they forget to use it, or they don't know where to find the logo. And so content tends to end up off brand. And what happens is you end up with this off brand, really poorly designed content. So if you take a look at this poster, what is your perception of the event? Does this look like a high quality event based off of the design of this poster? And I don't point this out necessarily to like shame the person who created this. They are probably doing the very best they can with the resources that they had. But the consequence of this is yeah, poor design can actually impact the overall perception of your brand and the quality of it and the quality of your event or whatever it is that you're promoting. So let's take another poll. What percentage of organizations see off-brand content created? All right, so the majority are saying 88%, some even 100%. So you guessed right. It's 88% of organizations have seen content created and distributed that does not conform to brand guidelines. And that's the people who are willing to, to – the question in the survey was, have you ever seen off-brand content? So it's possible that this is even higher in reality. So let's take a moment. I just want you to think, based off this prin first principle, is your brand creating memorable, consistent moments in our customer's journey? And in the chat, I'd love to get your thoughts on some ways your company seeks to maintain brand consistency. Is there anything that has, you found has worked really well for you that you could share with the group? All right. Principle number two is scalability and continuity. 
So let's talk about another really common experience in today's organization. So your creative team first got into marketing or design because they wanted to work on high-impact creative projects. And ideally, that's where they would spend the most of their time um, because ultimately your team does need to create a lot of content. All right, we're getting some things in the chat. Using templates, train sales on using content, shut down sales from creating content. All right. So um, a collateral and content playbook, lockable templates. People alt templates help, but people alter them. That's a good point. Using Canva for marketing team of one. Creative team doing editorial and brand reviews. Yeah, these are all great points. Awesome. So when thinking about scalability, uh, where we end up is your team ideally wants to focus on these high-impact projects, but then a lot of them end up in this situation, especially if it's a larger company, where your designer and creative team are mainly getting a ton of edit requests. And I wouldn't even say that these are necessarily design-focused requests. It's something like, can you please update the numbers in this chart for the sales team, or can you customize this headline with the customer's name. And so they're stuck handling all of these edit requests um, just to try to keep everyone moving and flowing. Uh, so in the chat, I'd love to hear what are edit requests that you and your team constantly see that you wish could maybe just be handled by someone else or go away? Changing dates, title changes, one or two words, email headers. I don't like the color. That's always one. Make the image prettier. Bullet points, numbers. Why are we using that image? Yeah. Looks tacky. Oh, that's always rough. just moving content layout around. Yeah, so there's just, what I'm saying, there's just a ton of like little tiny things that you don't necessarily need a design degree to, to do necessarily, and it just kind of inundates your time. So, I mean, it seems like, I mean, we've pretty much all encountered this. It's a universal problem. And a big reason this happens is because scaling design is just really hard. Scaling that across a company full of non-designers and non-creatives is super hard. And so you end up in this situation where you have to have a lot of blind faith. You have to hope that people are doing what they should. You have your creative team, if you have one, is able to end up overloaded with all of these production requests. And then you have your sales team who might spend a bunch of time looking for content instead of selling. And so what we want to do is transition this over to focusing on how – oops, skipping ahead here – how we can get more done as a team. So how can we create the right content at the right time? How can we send content – to the right places and the right people, all while cutting down on those edit requests and boosting employee morale because instead of focusing on all of these mundane things, they're able to focus on what they really wanted to do to begin with. So let's talk about how do we actually go about scaling experiential content production. So first, you're going to conduct an audit of how your content is distributed and used in your organization. So what I want you to do here, so when you think about your process, you probably immediately think of your process map. 
Like this is the typical way that this is supposed to function. What I want you to do is put that aside and said what we're looking for here are the holes and the problems with that current process. So what you're going to do, you're going to do two things. First, I want you to go up to a member of your sales team or someone who regularly uses marketing content and ask them the used car question. Now, what's the used car question? It sounds like this. What is the worst part about trying to use content right now? And then you're going to pause. And if you pause long enough, that discomfort from the silence will be enough to get them to open up and be very brutally honest about that worst part is. And if for some reason they still won't answer you, send the intern and get them to ask because this is really important. Second, make sure you're including every single stakeholder in this. So when we think of content, our mind typically goes to marketing, marketing communication, sales, but to really make sure that this experience is good and cohesive for your customers, you also need to talk to people like your channel sales partners, people who are a step away from the company, your customer success reps. They also use a lot of content. Your agencies even. What is the production process like for them? What is the usage process like for them? And then only after you've really got an idea of those holes will you be able to decide, okay, this is what's going wrong, so let's look at a software or service that fixes that specific problem. Step two is scaling content effectiveness. So this is the actual substance of how good is this content really. So real quick, let's talk about some strategies most of us already know. So content recommendations based on user data. That is the B2B equivalent of product recommendations in e-commerce. So taking that user data and providing those recommendations. Segmenting co content based on the customer, where the customer is in the user journey, really important. And hopefully by now we're all no longer using broken personalization tokens in our email. So those are things we know about being timely, being dynamic, being personalized. But two changes I want to pose to you today are one, when you're thinking about personalization, I want to broaden this to the actual content production process where you're thinking about what specific details do I know about the person I'm speaking to that I can include in this content? What are the inside jokes? What are the really specific problems they face? And then filling the content so full of that, almost to the point where if someone wasn't in that persona's demographic, they would not understand it and they would not get the joke. And the benefit of that is, one, you are connecting with that person on a much deeper level, creating that empathy that you need in your marketing content. But two, it's also helping to automatically filter out the people you don't want to reach so that you're no longer collecting leads and sending leads to sales that really aren't qualified. And then the second thing you should think about is, how can you make this content dynamic for your employees as well so that they can take that content, go in and tweak it so that it is timely and it is personalized and do that in a really seamless and fast manner. And then step three, once you've done the first two steps, you really, that's when you start scaling for production and eliminating silos throughout your organization. So what we found at Lucid Press is it generally consists of three things. One, you still need your project management system because you still have to create new content. And that's what helps keep your team on pace creating those new campaigns. But then after that, you need a really simple, really easy content creation software that all of your non-designers can use. And what that allows them to do is go in, access content marketing already created, and make those simple, minute tweaks that your team is so tired of making for them. And connected to that, where you're able to create that brand consistency that's really important, have a brand assets hub that integrates with it. So this could be your dam or a smaller version, but that integrates with it so that as they're editing, they can pull in the correct logo and the correct colors as they go. And by the way, I'm not going through this full checklist. If you'd like to get the full checklist for this process, 
go ahead and grab this bit.ly link and, and that will get you that full checklist to take back to your organization. All right, final principle is personalization. So we all know personalization is important. Um, according to McKinsey, personalized content can help drive anywhere between a five and 15% increase in revenue. And a lot of the times when we think about personalization, this is where our mind goes. We're either thinking about collecting customer data, so brand monitoring, machine learning, your social media listening tools, and then you're thinking about delivery. So how can I use dynamic ads and marketing automation and chatbots and AI to deliver the right content at the right time? But there's this bulky middle part that we tend to leave out, and that is we create content and we design content in between those two things. And so as you're thinking about filling that gap of content creation and design, you want to think about a few things. One is creating an ecosystem that grows and adapts based on customer insights and templatizing that content so that it, it can be streamlined and it can be scaled across your organization. Staying agile, so creating agility to respond to different customer needs in real time and based off of different circumstances. And then, of course, putting restrictions in place in the system to maintain that brand consistency that's so important. And then finally, think about leveling the playing field. So how can you make sure that everyone in your organization can access and personalize content easily? So I am going to walk you through how we do this internally at Lucid Press and, and showing how we apply these three principles of consistency, scalability, and personalization. So one, like I said, we still have a project management system. So this is our process for our sales team. They can go in. If they need something brand new, they have a new demographic they're targeting, this is where they can go in and make that creative request. But on top of that, within Lucid Press, we set up these templates organized by department and content type so that whenever the sales team needs a new presentation or a new flyer, they can go in, grab this template, and use that for what they need. And an added element to this to help present uh, excuse me, protect our brand is we start locking things down. So you'll notice we have that red lock around our logo. So that prevents the sales team from changing it, warping it, editing it in any way. They cannot change it at all. Then we have the yellow lock. That provides a, a partial lock to the content. So what that does is they still cannot change the font or the layout or the size of the content, but they can go in and tweak what the words actually are. And so that allows them to then go in and personalize and customize the content where instead of saying our commitment to X, Y, Z, they're then able to then change that and put in the name of the actual company. So here are some results from us implementing this process internally. So last quarter, we saw 100% content usage by the sales team. We also recently went through a small brand refresh. We updated our logo and a lot of our colors. And so because all of this content was housed in this templated system, we were able to go through, update it, and see a 75% adoption of that brand refresh within three months. And the examples I gave were for our sales team, but we've actually implemented this across our company to every single department. So it includes internal communication, engineering, customer success. And so we also saw adoption just organization-wide, and 80% of the organization used a brand template in Q1. So I'm going to leave you with a final thought, but we also have time for Q&A. So go ahead and go in and drop those questions in if you have one uh, while I give this final thought. So 
a lot of you are probably familiar with design thinking. And the framework a lot of people talk about is three of the circles you see on this image here. So one, you have desirability, or how much does will the customer want or benefit from this idea? Then you have viability, or can we actually make money from the idea? And then there's feasibility, or can we actually do it? Is it actually possible to do this thing? And the thought I'll leave you with is we really need that fourth circle in there for businesses to really benefit from scaling design thinking. And that means adding in, does this idea help communicate the brand image and brand story that we're trying to get across? Because in a world where good design is expected, scaling understanding of your brand identity across your organization will empower your brand to forge lasting brand relationships. And thanks so much for joining. We do have a free copy of our content experience guide in the handout. So if you go to handout section, you can just grab that the PDF up for grab for you as well. And then we can go ahead and switch over to Q&A. All right, Christina, thank you so much. Um, so I have a couple questions that have come through here. And one of them is uh, from Sandy. She was wondering about um, when you were talking about having that 100% content usage by the sales team. So did that mean that they were all using content? They used all the content all the time? Or was it just the templating? What Could you dig into that metric a little more? Yeah, so what that meant was every single person on the sales team used one of the brand templates that quarter. That's what I'm referring to. And then from Justin, uh, he wants to know, uh, do you believe that the market is leaning or will be leaning more towards smaller business experience now? Yeah, so I, um, I think you're asking, will experiences with small businesses matter more? Along those lines, especially I think as you're talking about how, you know, in the next few years, you know, 50% of large businesses, uh, there's going to be a big upheaval there. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think it's it will apply to everyone, small businesses and large businesses. I know large businesses tend to be at a particular disadvantage because they have a harder time changing and adapting. And so that's really where they're struggling is they need to do that and they're, sh and they're having a hard time. And that's where small businesses, if they were to come in and really focus on that experience, they could really stand out and thrive. Okay. Um, and then from Peter, he wants to know, uh, how does creating a content experience relate to AI? Yeah, so I mean, AI is a great delivery method. It's a great way of learning about customers and then putting the right content in front of them. But of course, to do that, you have to have that content to begin with. And so that's really where if you focus on your content experience and scaling that, then AI will become even more useful because you'll have that content available. Mm -hmm. um, and then one more here from Carl. Uh, so, um, you know, he says that different customers have different expectations uh, or, and value um, with the brand. So, you know, when you're targeting, uh, do you differentiate, differentiate your customer experience by customer profitability, or is there another metric you recommend? Sorry, that, that cut out a little bit. Could you repeat that? Oh, sure. So when you're differenti differentiating your customer experience, do you go off of the customer profitability or, you know, because you can't please all the people all the time, um, but what's kind of a metric that you would recommend uh, when building that differentiation? Yeah, I mean, I think you want to find your core audience. So the people that your brand story and basically the problem that your company solves really connects with. And so it should really be around what's going to help that particular group the most and be most profitable with them. And then one from Thomas, 
Uh, does Lucid Press Business Solutions house a content library or simply the templates? It's both, yeah. So you can include, we have templates that can go in and be customized, but they're also more like a finished piece of content. So you might have a finished one pager with all of your completed messaging, but then you could go through, for, for example, and add in the customer's logo really quick. And then in Lucid Press for business, we also have the brand assets hub. So you can store all of your brand assets, so your images, your logos, all of that, so that you can access those for, to pull into the templates as well. Great. Um, and then Rachel in the chat says, uh, does the project management system include an approval process when sales has created a template? So it can, yeah. So typically, um, we don't necessarily do approvals because all of the templates are created originally by our marketing team and then they're locked down so sales can only edit a few things. But if they are creating something new, we can t turn on an approval process where they then send it over to creative to review it and approve it. All right. Wonderful, well, that looks like uh is what we have time for right now. So thank you so much, Christina. Um, and everybody, our next presentation is going to begin at 2.15 p.m. And um, in the meantime, I uh, would like to invite everyone to the Lucid Press booth to review their content and interact with their team via chat. Thanks so much, Christina. Let's give her a virtual round of applause in the chat box.